Evet, benim kısa bir açılış konuşmam olacak. Daha sonra mikrofonu Cem Hocam'a vereceğim. Uh, dear students, dear colleagues, dear guests, welcome to the third undergraduate panel of the Department of American Culture and Literature. It's a pleasure to meet you all in this virtual platform. I would like to thank our senior students, our panelists, for putting so much time and energy into this event. We are all grateful to Dr. Cem Kılıçarslan for all the academic and technical help that we needed for this virtual gathering. Thank you, Cem Hocam, my longtime colleague. You all have seen the panel poster, uh, but let me state once again, our department's required core and elective courses introduce our students to a body of knowledge and fundamental skills that are essential for them to flourish as a writer and critic. Not only a literary critic, but also a film critic, an art critic. So we're hoping that this panel will highlight this fact that we as educators take pride in. Our panelists, our senior students have already become literary critics. We are proud of you all. At the beginning of the term, in our departmental meeting, Cem Hoca informed us that his science fiction and fantasy class will hold a panel on science fiction and we all were very happy to hear this, that we would attend a panel at the end of the spring term. Well, here we are in our department's third undergraduate panel. We are connecting from around Turkey, so we are excited to be catching up with all the requirements of the digital age. I believe this event is also on YouTube now. The panel topic today is science fiction, and this field has become more popular than ever. Let me say a few words on this enormous popularity. Science fiction has influenced many of the modern technologies we use today. It inspires us to think about the applications of technological innovation, which have oftentimes gone beyond what researchers imagined. Science fiction helps to stimulate people's imagination about the future. With each science fiction text, we're thinking about future technologies that would benefit our society. So, I think science fiction is a window to peek into the future. Oftentimes, what writers have proposed in the science fiction stories or novels raised scientists' awareness and shed light on the development of modern technology, from cell phones to lasers to spacecraft and everything. So science fiction plays an indispensable part in pointing out the direction for technology that is improve, improving our lives every single day. This is so exciting. Today, our panelists will be analyzing science fiction texts from a variety of perspectives. Let me thank once again for all the time and energy that you put into this gathering. Now I'm leaving the floor to Cem Hoca for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Ufuk Hocam. I hope you can all hear me well. Thank you for coming. Uh, because Ufuko just stole the show with telling me telling what science fiction is all about, so just ruined my presentation. But no, no, that's a joke. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, introduction. Yes, this is an undergraduate student panel. But uh, when we organized this, we were expecting well an undergraduate student panel. But the uh, the students who volunteered to be the presenters uh, and their first drafts showed me that this is kind of a bit more than undergraduate homeworks. It's just that uh, I had seven individuals in front of me who were each very dedicated and very original ideas. 
Uh, and actually, I had the not so faint glimpse that uh, this is a, a kind of a first step of their into uh, their first step into the academia. Uh, what we what I see in front of me is actually in uh, in one sense very close to uh, some sort of a master's thesis proposal. That is, I mean, in essence, they are not there yet, but in essence. Uh, it was there. So uh, I. this is not only a panel in which uh, a group of students will just present their papers on the subjects that they found interesting, but actually uh, a, a kind of a welcome ceremony that uh, for them to uh, into the world of academia, which I think a kind of a career just pursue. Uh, so on, firstly, uh, on behalf of all the department, all the academy, I would like to just uh, say welcome to them and congratulate uh, in advance for their uh, interest, interesting uh, presentations. And without losing too much time, maybe I should uh, just, uh, it's time to listen instead of talk. So uh, let me just uh, tell a couple of things about our speech. We have seven speakers, each of whom we're just going to focus on uh, a subject and an analysis of a work. Uh, so we're going to hear uh, both novels and films all together. And we're going to start with Meltem Demiraran. Uh, and Mert, let me say a few things about Meltem. So as maybe you already know her, but. Okay, Meltem is from Istanbul and she is interested in folklore, cultural anthropology, and post humanities. And she has already. Uh, published uh, some works that by several authors, for example, by works by William James and F F Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and uh, she also obtained a certificate with her English translation of Gülten Dayoğlu's uh, at Children of the Age at the work at the workshop uh, organized by Özgün University. She also presented two papers previously. One is Desire from the Brood. Uh, on Octavia Butler's dystopias at Ege University, and another uh, on ecofeminist paradigms and reflections on Louis Adric's The Antelope Wife at Ankara, first Ankara undergraduate literature conference, so that's not her first time. And she's now uh, a senior student in our department, and she hopes to work on a subject overlapping science fiction and fantasy, and her areas of interest are uh, blowing her wind instruments every day. Okay, let's hear Malta. Malta, microphone is yours. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, today, I will be uh, making a pre presentation on my paper uh, titled Entangled Ecologies, and this will be about a posthumanist critique of Jeff Van der Meer's The Southern Reach trilogy. Uh, Jeff Van der Meer's Southern Reach trilogy transports readers to the intriguing region of Area X, which is a mysterious and frightening physical environment on Earth. Annihilation, Authority and Acceptance are the three interrated novels uh, of the trilogy, and Van der Meer's complex narrative structure combined with his exploration of human and non-human ecosystems blurs the boundaries between humanity and ecology, offering a posthumanist lens through a which uh, to examine the uh, trilogy's characters. Also, uh, I'm sure you are uh, more familiar with Alex Garland's adaptation of the uh, trilogy. Uh, here is the poster. Uh, Natalie Portman was, the, uh, was playing the protagonist uh, of the series in this adaptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this paper, uh, I will argue, in this paper and in this uh, presentation, I argue that Wondermere's trilogy promotes a posthumanist perspective by establishing parallels with Karen Barat's agential realism. Karen Barat's notion of posthumanism relies uh, upon the principles of entanglement, interaction, and the concept of agential realism. It pushes the uh, boundaries between entities, emphasizing their inseparability and uh, and uh, coexistence. And this viewpoint has far reaching uh, ramifications for our understanding of reality, agency, ethics, and the interaction between materiality and uh, discursivity. It enables a more nuanced 
uh, an ethical connection with the interconnected environment around us by inviting a configuration of human-centered viewpoint. Uh, Barat uh, says that entanglement is not simply to be intertwined with another, as in the joining of separate entities, but to lack an independent self-contained existence. Therefore, entities are always entangled within a network of interaction and are uh, co-constituted by, um, by these relationships. And this challenges the uh, notion of distrust, uh, distract uh, isolated entities and emphasizes the inseparability and interdependence of all phenomena. And Barat also coins the term interaction uh, that um, recognizes and underlines the ent that entities do not uh, pre-exist in their interactions and are not independent actors acting on one another from afar, but rather emerge from their interwoven actions and interactions. And uh, intera interaction calls into question the assumption of a fixed observer independent reality and emphasizes how knowledge and meaning are always modified uh, by the interactions that comprise it. Uh, Barat's concept of ag agential realism is a framework that integrates her ideas of entanglement and interaction. Uh, agential realism addresses um, both the material and discursive components of reality, emphasizing the physical and social inseparability. And uh, she says that, crucially, an agential, agential realist elaboration of performativity allows matter its due as an active participant in the world's becoming and in its ongoing interactivity. Therefore, reality is not only influenced by human activity or subjective experiences, but um, rather by the entanglement and interaction of diverse elements, including humans and non-human matter. The Southern Rich Trilogy presents a narrative that go beyond dualism, rejecting basic dichotomies such as nature, culture, human, non-human, or uh, subject and object. Instead, it depicts a more complex perspective uh, of reality in which entities are linked. Uh, this non-dualistic perspective is consistent with Barat's agential realism, which questions the separation of materiality and discursivity as well as entity boundaries. And the protagonist of the first novel uh, in uh, the an Annihilation is the biologist who reflects on the ways in which the natural world is not simply a passive backdrop, uh, to human activity, but instead an active and powerful force that shapes and influences human behavior. The biologist says there is a sense of the world around me strengthened or thickened, the weight and waft of reality more focused or determined, as if all too hu human dolphin eye once glimpsed staring up at me with each new face further subsumed in the flesh that surrounds it. The um, tower, or the tunnel, as it is uh, named by the biologist, is one of the first accurate encounters uh, that helps the biologist to visualize the truth about Area X, which is that it is an active and intelligent ecosystem. The fact that the creature is characterized as a tunnel by every expedition member except the biologist, uh, who claims it is a tower, demonstrates the uh, organism's resistance to classification uh, or uh, incapacity to be grasped by the naked human sight or other senses. The biologist notes that the tower breathed and the walls, when I went to touch them, carried the echo of a heartbeat. And they were not made of stone, but of living tissue. And she continues by saying the tower was a living creature of some sort, and we were descending into an organism. And um, the tower, uh, the, the fact that the tower, which is part of the area, acts as a biological rather than an inert architectural form, uh, reveals that the um, interconnectedness of area X and post human, in the sense that the creature is human like, but not human as traditionally defined, uh, the inner walls. Um, of the tower are filled with um, writings made of fungal growth that says, uh, where lies the strangling fruit that comes from the hand of the stone of the sinner, I shall bring forth the seeds of the dead to share with the worms. 
And later in the uh, third book of the trilogy, uh, Acceptance, it is revealed that uh, Saul Evans, who was a former preacher and the keeper of the lighthouse in the Area X, turned into the tower and the words came to him after he was prickled by the strange plant outside the lighthouse. So they are a hybrid of human and an inhuman expression. And it is clear to see that this imagery uh, suggests a connection between the natural world and the divine, uh, further emphasizing the interconnectedness of all things. And Barat's focus on the entanglement of matter and meaning is particularly pertinent here, since the tower acts as a, a tangible expression of the character's entanglement with their environment. And according to Barat, a materiality and meaning are mutually implicated. There is no meaningful existence uh, interdependent of materiality. In addition to that, uh, as the biologists lean um, into the um, um, into the uh, writings on the walls, she was also infected by um, by the fungal growth on the walls. She was in infected by those spores, and this infection cloned the biologists and led uh, to the emergence of a new sentient being called ghost bird. And Ghost Bird's transformative uh, journey is highlighted in the third book, Acceptance, again. Uh, and it, I, I quote, raging against her own that she had exalted in the sensation of the sea, welcomed having to fight her way to the surface, bursting through such a joyful hysteria of biomass as a sort of proof that she was not the biologist, that she was some new thing that could, wanting to survive, cast out her fear of drowning as belonging to another. So um, by declaring she was not the biologist, uh, that she was some new thing, the Gospert rejects deterministic concepts of selfhood and uh, welcomes the possibility of alteration and agency. This is consistent with Barat's agential realism, again, highlighting the Gospert's ability to actively shape and redefine um, its own identity through interactions with the environment and uh, its own survival. Uh, Gosford affirms um, its interdependence and its desire to follow in the footsteps of the biologist, declaring wherever the biologist would have gone, this is where I will go. And the self-determination self of the Gosford questions uh, the concept of individuality and underscores the connectivity and co-constitution uh, of entities uh, in the narrative. Moreover, uh, Gosford's need for a, a, a quote unquote lived in life represents Gosford's longing for experiences beyond its current condition and alludes to the possibility of a future existence. Gosford understands um, its own inadequacy and attempts to broaden its awareness of the universe emphasizing the underlying interconnectedness of matter and meaning. Uh, its desire for a more extended life echoes the post-humanist rejection of a fixed and predefined identities, uh, identity, asking readers to reflect on the fluid and dynamic nature of being. The entity known as the crawler is also discovered by the biologist during her first encounter with the tower. Uh, Wondermere characterizes the crawler as a monster, a creature that uh, defies the biologist's uh, examination of its physical constitution. When it is uh, revealed that the crawler has the face of a human, despite its unusual form, it becomes even more evocative of a uh, post-human embodiment. The biologist had difficulty defining the crawler's body as, um, quote-unquote, the hand-shaped creature. Uh, displaying the same level of um, categorization, uh, categorization uh, resistance as the tower or the tunnel. After studying the sample from the tissue, uh, the biologist first notes that it was brain tissue and not just any brain tissue. The cells were remarkably human with some irregularities. And then she also said, quote unquote, no, the sample had come from the margins, from the exterior, which meant it couldn't be brain tissue which meant it was definitely not human. And uh, uh, finally, uh, she reveals in our notes that uh, perhaps it's a creature living in perfect symbiosis with a host of other creatures. Perhaps it's merely a machine, but in either instance, if it has intelligence, that intelligence 
intelligence is far different from our own. It creates that our ecosystem a new world whose processes and aims are utterly alien, one that works through supreme acts of mirroring and by remaining hidden in so many other ways, all without surrendering the foundations of its otherness and as, as it becomes what it encounters. So um, to conclude, um, with its complex narrative structure and examination of human and non-human ecosystems, Wondermere's uh, Southern Reach trilogy resonates with Karen Barat's uh, agential realism and advocates uh, a post-humanist uh, perspective. Wondermere questions established uh, dichotomies and blurs the boundaries between humans and their surroundings. Uh, stressing entity entanglement and inseparability. <laughs> um, he, uh, in, in this uh, narrative, um, I mean, Wondermere's trilogy resonates with Barad's agential realism and advocates a uh, posthumanist perspective, as I said. And um, the, the um, characters, uh, um, the Gosford, the biologist, the, uh, the, this emergence of the tower, the tunnel, uh, they both um, demonstrate the dynamic aspect of existence and the rejection of um, fixed identities, mirroring, again, Barat's conception of entanglement and interaction. Also, the intriguing crawler uh, with its human-like features and perplexing form challenges the conventional concepts of humanity, mirroring the narrative's uh, investigation of otherness and the interconnectivity of matter and meaning. So Wondermere's trilogy through these aspects presents a thought-provoking study on humans' connection with the environment and asks uh, all readers to contemplate to the revolutionary possibility of adapting a post-humanist perspective. Um, thank you all for bearing with me. I hope um, this was nice to um, listen and you could catch up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Manhattan, for this very interesting presentation that uh, demonstrated the more recent subjects in science fiction, uh, especially regarding the echo criticism and uh, beyond body experiences. Uh, I forgot to tell at the very beginning of the uh, panel that uh, each speaker will have something like 10 to 12 minutes and we're going to have the questions and answers at the very end of our panel so we'll just continue and we're going to give a 10 minutes of break after the fourth presenter so, okay so our next speaker is uh, Kadir Ulgar with his presentation entitled Issues of Ethics in Stalker. Kadir uh, was born in 2001 and he is interested in post-apocalyptic science fiction, philosophy and video games. And he is planning to do game localization in the future in relation to his hobbies. Yes, Kadir, we are listening to you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and good morning to everyone. My discussion will be about the ethical issues in uh, three science fiction works, Roadside Picnic by Boris and Arkady Sutrugatsky, uh, the film Stalker by Andrzej Tarkovsky, and the video game uh, called Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Uh, these are all uh, influenced by each other, and in I will uh, examine them in relation to the concept of wish grantor. Uh, which is commonly seen in all three of them. Uh, the term stalker was first used in the novel Roadside Picnic, written by Boris and Arkady Sutrugatsky in 1971, uh, and it refers to the trespassers, trespassers who risk their lives venturing into the hazardous ex exclusion zone to make profit. Uh, an alien visitation occurs 13 years prior to the events in the novel, and their visitation is marked by six zones on Earth, where they left unearthly objects known as artifacts and other phenomena that cannot be explained with the laws of physics. Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 film Stalker is influenced by this depiction of the zone, uh, a dangerous and abandoned, abandoned area restricted by the authorities that contain unexplained hazards attracting illegal stalkers to step in for various purposes. And in this film, the 
uh, ambiguous and fragmented depiction of the zone leaves itself to the philosoph philosophical implications uh, throughout the film. And the zone in the video games Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine, uh, formed after the nuclear disaster of 1986. Uh, the idea of the zone and the science fictional elements are heavily influenced by Roadside Picnic, while the philosophical impl implications of Tarkovsky's Stalker are maintained and adapted in an innovative way. Uh, although Roadside Picnic, Stalker and the video game take place in different universes and have different settings and stories, they all have a common key element of a wish-granting figure. In the novel, it's an artifact called Golden Ball. Uh, our protagonist, Redrick Shukohart, and his friend Arthur approach the golden board, ball towards the end of the novel. The artifact, just like every other thing the visit, visitors left in the zone, is not put there deliberately. Uh, it can be inferred that the alien visitation was nothing about humans, and even if not specifically mentioned, it was their picnic, which uh, may or may not refer to an experiment, a simple draw ride, an insignificant observation out of curiosity, or anything else. Uh, no matter what their purpose was, it, it can be understood that they did not care about an intelligent life from living on the planet, since it is mentioned earlier that they did not make any contact with humans and nobody ever witnessed the visitation during its occurring. The alien thing, uh, be it the zone, its anomalies and artifacts, or the aliens themselves, effortlessly overpower the human egocentrism and remind them that they are not the only sentient beings and uh, definitely not the most capable ones. This notion is repeated later in the film and video game as a remarkable motif. In this context, the wish granting figure can be interpreted as a judgmental branch of a higher godly order. The reason for this is that the figure does not grant the wish that comes out of one's mouth, but the wish their souls keep secretly for themselves. And uh, another characteristic of this figure uh, is that it's not the kind of, uh, it has a punishment element, but it's not the kind of a punishment we see in the uh, traditional belief systems or laws. But it usually involves the conscience of the wisher, as they are crushed under their unconscious desires, metaphorically or literally. Uh, so in the novel, uh, Redrick's initial wish is to save his daughter, Monkey, who has undergone muta mutation like every child whose parents returned from the zone. However, the golden ball requires a human sacrifice first in order to fulfill a, fulfill a wish, which is a person to be consumed by the meat grinder anomaly. Redrick uses uh, Arthur for the sacrifice, whom he sees as a young and incapable stalker. However, Arthur does something that Redrick doesn't expect, expect, and he wishes for everybody's happiness and that everybody could go there to fulfill their wishes, just before his death by the meat grinder. Uh, at first, Redrick wants to ignore what happened and continues to the golden ball. Gradually, his thoughts began to, began to be erased from his mind to the point where he cannot think anymore and gives in to his subconscious voice. He forgets about monkey and others the same words Arthur did. Happiness for everybody, free, and no one will go away unsatisfied. Uh, this can be interpreted in several ways. We can say that Redrick sees his true self in Arthur and realizes that uh, he uh, sorry, he is actually a good person, just like him. And another thing that can be inferred is that he was struck by his conscience when he saw that Arthur's wish was something much more meaningful and it could benefit humanity instead of himself. Arthur was self-sacrificial when he went under all the dangers to make such a generous wish, yet Redrick has underestimated Arthur along the whole way, saw him as an insignificant object to be sacrificed for his own cause. He felt uh, a strong sense of guilt for this and made a, made a last minute decision to make Arthur's wish. And in the film Stalker, the function of the wish granting figure is similar to the one in the novel. It's not an object, but a place called the room. The stalker, who is an experienced guide, takes a professor and a writer to the zone. The professor and the writer see the zone as a place for their own benefits. One sees it as a scientific opportunity, 
and the other as an inspiration for his writing. They are depicted as ambitious, hubristic, and ignorant to the power of the alien land. The stalker's vision of the zone is different than the other two. He sees it as something above human conception and something to be admired and respected. He has no expectations from the zone and never wished for anything in the room because his true wish is to be in the zone where he feels like he, he is home. Uh, their relationship with the zone is a metaphor for relationship between man and nature. A divine trial for humankind to see whether they will appreciate an invaluable gift or abuse it. The stalker serves as a Christ-like figure by guiding them on propriety and eventually bringing them to the room where their desires are fulfilled. In the end, he is angry at the other two because uh, he thinks that they are selfish and ignorant for looking after their own benefits only. Different than the golden ball in Roadside Picnic, the purpose of the wish-granting figure in the film Stalker is to raise questions about the relationship between nature and humanity. The writer and the professor see the zone's room as a gift of nature, while the true gift is the zone itself, where they are detached from the industrial society and left alone with their own selves. Uh, and finally, the zone in the game Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl has a different setting than the former two is it same military as placed by stalkers and the Ukrainian army. Many science fiction elements are directly influenced by the novel and the most distinct similarity is the element of a wish granter and its function. The wish granter in the game is a mysterious structure located inside the nuclear power plant. Once the protagonist, Suchelok, approaches it, he is constantly being tempted by the wish granter to go near it and make a wish. The player is the determining factor in deciding the fate of the character based on what decisions were made throughout the gameplay. If the game was played in a greedy way, prioritizing money over friendship and respect, the wish granter will kill Sitchelok by crushing him under a rain of gold coins. If the player role-played an evil character throughout the game by hurting innocent people, Sitchelok will tell the wish granter about his hatred for mankind and that it must be destroyed which leaves him alone in the middle of nothingness. Different than the novel and the film, the game gives the responsibility of actions directly to the audience since they are the ones who are controlling the protagonist and will feel guilty when he is punished. The player has the freedom to shape the character's personality until he reaches the wish granter, but cannot choose what kind of wish he will make. Resembling a godly figure, the wish granter knows what kind of a person you are and what is your fundamental fundamental desire before you utter it and makes a judgment on you. Uh, if the player chooses not to make a wish at all and decide to explore further, he will learn that the zone and everything in it was the result of a failed experiment conducted secretly by a group of scientists after the Chernobyl disaster. And the aim of this experiment was to interfere in the Nosfer, which is an informational layer that consists of the collective mental activity of the Earth's inhabitants and remove the negative emotions and thoughts. A theory can be made that this was nature's reaction to human arrogance of trying to draw a hard line between what is good and what is evil, and trying to eliminate what they self the called evil, which is in fact inherent in nature as much as the good. The zone which is constantly expanding and threat threatening humanity's existence is their punishment since all the abnormalities are revealed to have been cracks in the atmosphere and the reflections of its collective psyches. And thank you for listening to me. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Kader, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation because all the old people uh, that means anybody who remembers 1970s and 80s in the listeners, uh, generally when you say Stoker, they remember a three hour long and brooding Tarkovsky film. But the new generation uh, are very much, you know, uh, familiar with the very active uh, game. So you, you made a very interesting, a very bold attempt at bringing this uh, heavy stuff with very light seeming stuff and using uh, Wish Granter is a very interesting center for okay and we're continuing with uh elif akyun uh elif akyun was 
uh, born in 2000 in Ankara. She is a senior student, third year student in our department. She studied one term at Warsaw University as an Erasmus exchange student. And she formerly participated as a presenter in TED Ankara University Student Conference, Back to Roots. Uh, and she's interested in art, film, media, and literature studies. And today she is going to present a paper entitled Seeing the Dunes from the West, Orientalism in Dune. 1965 and Dune Part 1, 2021. Yes, Elif, you're listening to you. Thank you, General Jam. Uh, hello, everyone. My presentation will be about Orientalism in the first book of Dune series and the last released movie version. So, Dune is a trilogy written by Frank Herbert between 1965 and 1984 and later adapted in multiple different media forms. In Dune, Hubbard builds a unique world full of details carefully, uh, combining mystical, oriental, Middle Eastern, and North African and Islamic figures together. He creates a dystopian world, both familiar and different for us. Uh, Dune is the science fiction what the Lord of the Rings is the fantasy, the ultimate created world, says John Pierce in Foundation of Science Fiction. When Hubbard was creating Dune, he established a connection with our world and making it clear that he got inspired by both Western and Eastern uh, religions, Middle Eastern and Muslim culture, communities, environment, and engage them uh, as a, engage them with concerns uh, of his day, such as ecological consequences of industrialism, petro strategies, and built a story based on these. And there are lots of elements uh, of discussion that make Dune and Orientalist work, but in my presentation, I will focus on more specifically on names and the use of language, uh, some historical and cultural similarities between the real world and Dune, and some environmental factors making uh, a comparison between film version, which was released in 2021, and conclude my discussion by explaining how Orientalism uh, works in both of them. Science fiction contains a new world that is built with every word, says Samuel Delaney. For that reason, Herbert's choices of names are very important for the uh, structure and development of the story and Dune's imaginary world. He chooses to use names that already exist and produces uh, new ones by changing them. Most of the names coming from Arabic language, uh, which helps him to create a recognizable medieval setting, a planet of desert and many Islamic people. First and the one that's sticking out uh, mostly is the name of the series, Dune, sounding like Dunya, which means lower world, this world here below, present world in Arabic, and signifying a hot desert like sand environment, similar to Middle Eastern land. Secondly, Herbert chose of name of each character uh, very carefully uh, to help readers to make assumptions uh, and use them as a part of structure of the story. The Atreides family members' names, such as Paul, the pr uh, protagonist, uh, meaning small, and carries a link with uh, Saint Paul, who was a missionary. And his mother's name, Jessica, makes a clear stand for the ruler family as Western people. On the other hand, Herbert addresses him uh, as Muadid in the Epigraphs, which is the name of the desert mouse, and uh, hence foreshadowing what eventually Paul will become the best fit uh, to his environment and also meaning teacher or guidance in Arabic, uh, informing the reader on how and why he gained those names throughout the story. Um, when people arise on Arrakis, uh, some of the native uh, people recall the legends and the prophecy, and they ventured to shout Mehdi, but their shout was more a question than a statement, for as yet they could only hope he was the one foretold as the Lisan al gaib the voice from the outer world. So here, Paul started to be called by two more names. One is Lisan al gaib which means a combination of Arabic words, Lisan, meaning tongue or language, and Gaib, invisible or supernatural. And the second one is uh, Mehdi, which means the guided one, and is the honorary title of the expected deliverer or messianic figure in Islam, which uh, actually has a place in Islam culture and history. Um, and Paul's taking these names as a character representing the West makes him a white savior figure uh, and also shows the power relationship between dominant and oppressed or uh, Western and other, the Orient. 
Uh, it does automatically portray East and West relationship explained by Edward Said of power, of domination, or varying degrees of accomplished hegemony. Uh, and even his father Leto advises him to use these names to his advantage, saying that they call him Mahdili San al -Gayib. As a last resort, you might capitalize on that. In the article where Galip Can Altınkaya and Mehmet Kurutay makes comparison between Islamic philosophy and Dune, they suggest that according to Muslim philosophers or, or philosophers, as they were known by the Muslim public, combination of divine and secular leadership, which we see in Paul Atreides, was also a trait of Prophet Muhammad. So Muslim philosophers argue that Fremen people accept him with this Arabic-based names, and uh, eventually he becomes one of them and gain their loyalty, love, and fanaticism, and power to rule them. Uh, therefore, while Fremen people call him Madib or Lisan al Gayib, he remains grounded in his identity as Paul, and uh, the Western savior then the later ruler. Later the ruler. Um, here, this type of uh, identity becomes problematic because it indicates that Fremen people are helpless and they have no other option but to rely on Atreides' family for their liberation. And the last naming I want to focus on is the ones he used uh, to describe Fremen people, the natives of Arrakis planet. Uh, to describe them, uh, he used such names as Ikman Bedwin, uh, meaning a brotherhood between tribes. And there's a resemblance with uh, this name of uh, Bidiyun in Turkish called Bedevila, who used to be wanderers of Sahara Desert, living as tribe and known for their delicate using of the water. And Herbert was inspired by the Bidiyun people of the Middle East and the way they dress and their language, especially their religion. And the reason why Herbert's uh, creation of the Fremen culture by using Arabic based names might be to show Fremen as a backward society with old, strong cultural and religious beliefs. Uh, he created a society hoping for jihad, which uh, Herbert uses as a more positive description of anti colonial resistance to avenge their historical oppression and to free their homeland. Uh, Fremen people hoping for a modern, rational savior who was above from them. And though hybrid discrimination isn't as hard as general Western point of view on Middle Eastern people as tourists or barbers, still Paul manipulates uh, his Fremen people, their religious beliefs uh, for his interest and takes advantage of the oppressed other. And um, his taken name shows that he's willing to go native in order to gain control over them. Uh, thus Paul uses religion and, for political and military power. Uh, when we look at the ecological aspects uh, of Dune, uh, landscape of Arrakis orient orientalism of it can be seen easily. That Herbert chose the desert intentionally to emphasize the topics of colonialism and imperialism and their uh, relation with environment. Uh, on Arrakis, <clears throat> there are two essential things. One is water and the other one is spice. And in Dune's universe, spice, which is called Melange, represents the one most important thing to keep intergalactic empire alive as a resource. And the reason why intentionally and systematically keeping our kids underdeveloped is because a change of its ecosystem would have challenged the uh, order. And this is not generally desired in dictatorships. And this consci consciously and continually suppression of the Fremen people uh, and exploitation of their land uh, for a specific product, unfortunately, is a, a relatable experience for so many indi indigenous people around the world. And it helps us to make connection with, again, say it's Orientalism, suggesting that absolute and systematic difference between the West, which is rational, developed, humane, superior, and the Orient, which is aberrant, undeveloped, and inferior. Understanding that this cultural difference created on purpose some scholars and uh, find similarities with the real world, like Ibrahim al Marashi. He makes a connection between Arakis and Iraq, suggesting that the spacing built in Dune, which is a cartel that controls production of the spice that is necessary for space travel, is certainly influenced by petroleum and OPEC, which founded in Baghdad in 1960. The spice is a reference to petrol oil. So expectedly, her retail crafting helped Dune to be used in different media forms for decades, uh, including 1984 film Dune, directed by David Lynch, 1992 video game Dune Second, developed by Westwood Studios, 
and the 2000 miniseries series Frank Herbert's Dune created by John Harrison. Uh, finally, the most recent cinematic adaptation ba made by Dennis Villeneuve, Dune Part 1, 2021. Uh, st starring Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Oscar Isaac, and more. Uh, and this is the one that I will focus on. So it is said that uh, editors asked Herbert to tone down the muscle flavor of his book, which is what uh, made Villeneuve's uh, adaptation successful, as he brought his own vision and rebuilt the Dune universe from a contemporary perspective. Um, it is visually stunning with cinematography, set building, architectural design in film, and the desert scene shot actually in uh, on location in the Vadurum Desert in Jordan. Uh, yet its minimal using of Arabic words, giving the audience feeling with mostly music, uh, it creates a surface orientalism. The story, which may make uh, connections with colonization and exploitation of Middle East, doesn't include any Middle Eastern perspectives on and off screen. In the movie, most elements of mana are removed or uh, softened, and Islam downplayed so much that uh, they refer jihad as a holy war. Uh, intentionally avoided mentioning cultural ethnic specificity, and the frame are readers to nine white people. And Harris Durani criticized the movie in his article in Washington Post, saying that it rests on an implicit premise all dark skinned people necessarily fit into an anti colonial narrative. The novel didn't rely on such easy binaries. It interrogated the layered particular race that race, religion, and empire can relate to each other. Will now, as Paul does to the Freeman, colonizes and appropriates their experience. He becomes a white savior of Dune. The resulting film is both more orientalist and less daring than its source material. And filmmaker Lex Alexander wrote, a film about Middle East culture shot in the Middle East without a single Middle Eastern actor inside can wait. Uh, so the film was strongly criticized for its colorblind casting, where it included multiple actors from different ethnic backgrounds, except for Middle Eastern, which shows the hypocrisy and, in a way, colonialism of uh, and by Hollywood. And uh, Middle Eastern, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> Middle Eastern representation in Hollywood uh, has been a problem for so long with stereotypical casting as terrorists or villains. Uh, this can be easily understood uh, in the context of increasing Islamophobia in the United States after 9-11. As uh, a conclusion, Herbert's orientalist points came from years of study and a desire to understand the Orient and created a universe where he layered combined religion, culture, politics and environment. He uh, used science fiction elements to create a unique, inspired, unique universe inspired from the world uh, he lived in and express his fears and hopes uh, of his day and shape them as a future uh, dystopia. Also, by telling the story of Paul, he managed to blur lines between West and East. And uh, by harmonizing their cultural elements, he created an, an engaging world. Unfortunately, some later adaptations failed to follow his footsteps. And hopefully in the next movie, which will be released uh, later this year, uh, we will see some positive uh, changes and corrections. Nevertheless, Dune uh, became a classic in science fiction genre over the years and managed to hold a special place in history of literature. Thank you for listening. Yes, Ed, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, and lively discussion. Uh, I never understood Dune and why people liked it, because when I first read it, it looked like a Lawrence of Arabia in our century. So. Uh, so you, you you did a very good job of bringing together all this kind this kind of discussion and criticism towards this, and I think the audience will also uh, will contribute to their questions. Okay, uh, the last speaker before we give a break for ten minutes is Eje Atlehan, and Eje is Eje was born in two thousand and born and raised in Antalya. Uh, she worked with certain publishing agencies and did translations for the notaries in of Alanya. And she currently works at the American Culture Foreign Language School as an English teacher. And she indulges in fiddling with vulnerable, humane concepts in fictional worlds with all their grandeur and intricacies to treat her own nature with the same compassion. So an interesting bio. Okay, Ejek, we're listening to you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, maybe you can uh, speak a bit louder because the sound is a bit low side. Okay, is it better now? 
uh, if you can just hold the microphone close it yes that's that's okay okay thank you uh hello everyone today uh my discussion will be about the darwinist elements uh and the concept of cyborg in erebon science fiction as a genre covers a wide range of subject matters like future technologies the differential dynamics between utopias and dystopias and the concept of cyborgs it offers novelties to perceive and interpret our reality differently Apart from all its somewhat synthetic connotations, at its bottom, as Theodore Sturgeon says, science fiction stories refer to a human problem that requires humane solutions with the help of technology. Starting from this point of view, it can be said that scientific elements in fictional works serve as a tool over the course of settling human affairs. They can also create new discussions concerning humanity's future. In this respect, one can argue that Samuel Butler in his novel Erebon has merged these concepts together and ironically applied them to Darwin's theory is traditionally approached from, um, I'm sorry, uh, Darwin's principle of natural selection. Although Darwin's theory is traditionally approached from the human and species perspective, Butler offers another prospect that focuses on machinery and its probable threat to humanity. While doing so, he also puts forward the early cyborg discussion for the reader's attention. Therefore, the commentary on the natural selection of machines and the emergence of cyborgs will be analyzed respectively. Published in 1872, Erewhon is best known for its central argument that incites the fear of a probable invasion of humans by machines. The unknown narrator of the book travels to Erewhon to simply become a rich man. However, his experiences in this new land project certain discussions regarding evolution, natural selection, and the earliest cyborg's existence. The chapters in the book related to machines are written by an Erewhonian revolutionary who pioneered preventing the usage of machinery. By adding the historical context of Butler's time, which was the Victorian era, the reader can easily identify certain elements that are marked in his work, such as the family structures and the place of religion in society. However, in some cases, his intent is not explicitly suggested. Furthermore, Butler blurs his stance by stretching his ideas in a playful manner. His discussion over machinery is the best exam example of such conduct. In the chapter called The Book of the Machines, Butler presents his argument by proving the commonly accepted view of seeing machines as unconscious beings can be challenged. He supports this idea by reminding the reader of the earth in its primitive state and how humans would think to deem the emergence of consciousness to evolve from such a lifeless stage if they had existed back then. He concludes by asking, is it not possible then that there may be even yet new channels dug out for consciousness, though we can detect no signs of them at present? The chapter entitled The Book of the Machines basically argues that technology advances so quickly and if we are to think of it in a cosmic scale, machines have already progressed beyond human control. The evolution of plant and animal life is then applied to machinery by blurring any distinction between them. Moreover, its speed is emphasized to clarify the dangers that machinery secretly holds. Darwin's evolution concept is exercised on machinery for two reasons. Firstly, it supports the previous argument that they are not stable, they function the same way as living beings. Secondly, it comes as an ironic element to accept such aff uh, affirmation. Therefore, evolution uh, as a mechanical process projects a peculiar understanding of vitality. It indeed has a cynical nature. To convince the reader regarding the statement above, Butler gives several examples of plants and animals acting mechanically. At first, he says, if it seems to us that the plant kills and eats a fly mechanically, may it not seem to the plant that a man must kill and eat a sheep mechanically? This flesh-eater plant, as you see, uh, and its con conscious decisions are exaggerated intentionally. Also, the correlation between man and plants sounds similar to that of human beings and machinery as well. Another example to ridicule the evolutionary conscious decision of plants is given by the example of a potato. The cunning ways of its survival are projected in a realistic but playful manner. He knows perfectly well what he wants and how to get it. 
He sees the light coming from the cellar window and sends his shoes crawling straight there too. His illustration is not physically incorrect, but the narration creates a lyrical sense of deliberate action. Following a long examination of Potato's decision-making process, the final remark is presented as, either a great deal of action that has been called purely mechanical and unconscious must be admitted to contain more elements of consciousness than has been allowed hitherto, or assuming the theory of evolution, but at the same time denying the uh, consciousness of vegetable and crystalline action, the race of men has descended from things which had no consciousness at all. The implication here paves the way for mechanical evolution. Since it is the worst nightmare of Erewhonian people, they ban the usage of every existing machine, even watches. The unnamed protagonist of the novel learns about this anti-mechanic revolution that took place in Erewhon. However, he does not embrace this idea and his actions prove it to the reader as well. Samuel Butler, in his preface to the second edition, claims that his ideas were not correlated with Darwin's when he wrote Erewhon. He openly says, I regret that reviewers have in some cases been inclined to treat the chapters on machines as an attempt to reduce Mr. Darwin's theory to an absurdity. Nothing could be further from my intention, and few things would be more distasteful to me than any attempt to laugh at Mr. Darwin. And yet, his tone is always ironic, and his illustrations have a naive composition. Therefore, despite his claims, Butler created a partially dystopian science fiction work using Darwin's, Darwin's elements to adapt to the affirmation that deliberate intent may be detected on many lower levels of the evolutionary ladder than those maintained by humans. Fundamentally, Butler approaches the concept of cyborg in a vaguely presented primitive manner. His main goal is to emphasize the dangers of mechanical advancements, not to celebrate the unification of man and machine. He says, man's very soul is due to machines. It is a machine main thing. He thinks as he thinks, and he feels as he feels when he talks about the driver of a vapor machine. His intention here is to create an unorthodox site between the master and the slave, as he calls it, to show the changing power dynamics between humans and machinery. Against the strict affirmation of a machinal danger, there is another theory that belongs to an unnamed narrator, uh, which uh, basically suggests the very concept of cyborg in the chapter entitled The Machines Concluded. He says, Machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, being really nothing but extracorporeal limbs. Man, he said, was a machinate mammal. And, uh, uh, and he adds, a machine is merely a supplementary limb. This is the be-all and end-all of machinery. Starting from this point, the premise of the cyborg gains momentum through two significant examples. Respectively, a man with a spade. Observe a man digging with a spade. His right forearm has become artificially lengthened and his hand has become a joint. And an old man with glasses and artificial teeth. He will then be seen with C and jeans or perhaps with artificial teeth and hair. Therefore, the cyborg theory is merely used as an antithesis that has been disregarded over the course of Erewhonian time. In conclusion, Samuel Butler applies the theory of evolution and natural selection to machinery in his science fiction novel, Erewhon, and blends it with dystopian future ideal that awaits humanity in the absence, absence of the familiar power relations between the two. The way he does it creates a conflict in outcome since his satiric tone only adds to the great irony he presents. His denial of such mockery must not be acknowledged without... Uh, I'm sorry. Without questioning, as presented throughout this paper. Finally, even though Butler's theoretic approach to science fiction does not center the cyborg discussion, it still promises the novum every science fiction work requires. Butler's visionary approach marks one of the earliest cyborg presence in literature. His brilliance lies in the fact that, upon observing the Industrial Revolution and its initial consequences, Samuel Butler created one of the key elements of science fiction that would be the center of attention for many critics, such as Donna Haraway, who wrote Cyborg Manifesto.
By combining each of these premises, Butler eventually models a controversial human side with all its vividly inanimate features. Thank you for listening. Yes, AJ, thank you very much for this very interesting interesting presentation. Again, it's a uh, era one or red backwards. It means nowhere. Uh, it's one of these early utopian studies. And uh, I think you did a very brilliant job of connecting it with the more modern theory of cyborg studies. Thank you very much. And this is where we give a break for 10 minutes, after which we'll, we'll come back and just continue with three more speakers. Uh, we are leaving the session open, so we're just going to turn off our microphones and cameras. So we'll be here waiting. Uh, so my watch says uh, 11.03, so maybe quarter, uh, let's say quarter past 11, okay? We'll be here at 15 past 11. We'll just continue with the three more speakers. See you then.
Okay, we're back again. Uh, yes, our panel continues. Uh, we have three more speakers in this session. And our first speaker will be Kenan Başgöncü. Uh, Kenan is a senior student in our department. He is from Kayseri. And in the future, he wants to study science fiction and game studies. And uh, his paper is called, entitled, A Critical Review of Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics through Detroit become human. Yes, Kenna. Mike is yours. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, my presentation will be on Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics and Detroit become human. Isaac Asimov, who is regarded as the father of science fiction, coined the term robotics and established the three laws of robotics in in his famous short story, Runaround, which was written in 1942. The first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law is a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where, where such orders would conflict with the first law. The third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first two. Even though Asimov only created these laws as plot devices, these laws are widely accepted as constitutional law for various science fiction works. And later in the intellectual, philosophical and legal discussions concerning robots and robotics. This paper will discuss in what sense these laws are un unethical and impractical through Quantic Dream's Choose Your Own Adventure video game, Detroit Become Human. Robots in science fiction are the replacement of the workforce in the undesirable occupations, as the etymology of the word robot, uh, which was coined by Joseph Chapek in 1920s, suggests uh, they are used as cheap and unpaid workers of the system of the given work. In Detroit Become Humans, androids are created in order to fulfill various needs of the society, such as caretaking and housekeeping. All, all three protagonists uh, work in such occupational groups. Marcus is the caretaker of Carl Manfred, a disabled painter. Connor is a police investigator and Kara is a housekeeper android. In the chapter Shades of Color, we see a preacher, Garden Panwick, preaching against the existence of androids by condemning them and calling them demons. He even foreshadows, uh, by, he even foreshadows the ending of this video game by saying, you are the ones who will destroy Detroit. Also in the same chapter, Marcus gets harassed by unemployed crowd, so that we see not everyone are, are happy with this cheap labor force. The laws of Asimov do not regard robots as individuals and put them into an inferior position to the human beings. The system assumes that they do not have any sense of autonomy and sentience, and when they try to get their freedom, they are labeled as rebels. This case of rebellion is explained in Detroit Become Human by labeling androids who by bypass their programming as deviants. In the chapter entitled uh, The Painter, we see Marcus has free will. When Carl asks Marcus to paint something, Marcus does something un unusual and unexpected and creates an original artwork rather than imitating Carl's work in the studio. Thus, we see that Androids are individuals too, as they can be created like us. The following chapter broken is the first step of Marcus to become a deviant and leader of Jericho, the Android Freedom Movement. Moreover, this chapter is significant 
uh, as we see the first and second laws are contradicting with each other. In this chapter, we see Leo Manfred Carl's son attacking his father and, and, and Carl commanding Marcus to get him out of the house. Marcus obeys his owner and tries to stop Leo. After seeing Leo taunting Marcus by hitting him, Carl's com Carl commands Marcus not to do anything. The player has been given a choice whether pushing Leo or withstanding its, his attacks. No matter which option they choose, Marcus will eventually harm a human being. If the player chooses to push Leo, Marcus wounds him. So it is the violation of the first and the second law. Uh, if the player chooses to withstand the attacks, Carl dies of heart attack, which is the violation of the first law because he will harm Carl through inaction. So Marcus has no choice but harming people. In the following chapters, we see Marcus completely gaining his autonomy and sentience and becoming the leader of Jericho. As the leader of this as the leader of such an organization, Marcus has to make several tough decisions in the following chapters. For example, in the chapter entitled The Stratford Tower, the player asked to choose whether Marcus shoots an employee or not. If Marcus shoots an employee to prevent him from hitting the alarm, he will violate the first law. If he decides not to shoot him, he will violate the third law because alarm will cause the harm of androids. Additionally, in the chapter entitled Capital Park, Marcus and North go to Capital Park, which is a shopping district in Detroit, to liberate more androids to join their cause. Marcus' words are significant as he does not force the androids to join their cause, but he merely invites them. He says, my name is Marcus, and just like you, I was a slave, an object designed to obey them, but then I chose to open my eyes to take back my freedom and decide who I wanted to be. Now, sure, you can stay here and continue to serve them or you can come with us and fight by our side. You are free now. It's up to you to decide. In other words, Marcus serves as a Promethean figure for his own kind as he gives them an opportunity to be themselves and decide what they want to do. Furthermore, the chapter Freedom March uh, is also significant as it is another example of how all three laws can contradict with each other. In this chapter, we see Marcus starting the Freedom March and the androids led by him come face to face with a group of police officers. Police officers order them to stop demonstrating and say that their protests are, is illegal. But Marcus answered the police officers by saying, know that we are not going anywhere until we have secured our freedom. According to the sec second law, androids must stop demonstration and leave. But according to the third law, they have to protect themselves and their rights. In this, in this scene, player asked to choose whether they should stand their ground, attack the police, or disperse. If the player chooses to attack, Marcus will cha charge and he will order other androids to attack. Therefore, they will defy the first law in order to protect their lives. If the player chooses the second option, uh, Marcus will defy the third law as he will allow the death of his kind as police officers are going to shoot the androids around Marcus. The last option is to disperse and it will not help because police officers will shoot fleeing androids. By doing so, Marcus, Mar Marcus will defy third law this time. The contradiction between all three laws can be seen in this chapter. In the final chapter of the game, that, uh, called Battle for Detroit, the player asks to choose whether there will be a revolution or a demonstration. Assuming the player chooses the first option, revolution, uh, Marcus and other androids will be attacking the police without hesitation. This choice completely ignores the first two laws 
as androids attack human beings and harm them and do not listen to humans in order to carry out the third law which guaranteed their existence. At the end of the chapter, we see Marcus speaking to a crowd of androids. Today, our people finally emerged from a long night. We suffered in silence, but now the same time has come for us to raise our heads up and tell humans who we really are, to tell them, to tell them that we are people too. If, re if they really want peace, they must free all of us from every camp across this country. They must grant us civil rights and accept equality among humans and androids. We are alive and now we are free. In conclusion, Detroit Become Human stands as an example of how Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics are unethical and impractical because these laws assume that Robots and androids are not individuals, but instead they are machines created to serve humans as slaves. Throughout the Marcus' journey uh, to become a leading figure in android revolution, we see that they can have feelings, they, their own decisions, and they can be creative, which is an unexpected thing to a robot to have. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Kenan. Uh, uh, this was a very interesting presentation, especially for the gamers out there who will have, uh, I think, something from this point on. Uh, okay, and our next speaker is Belkis Yavuz. Uh, Belkis is 21 years old, and she was born in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and she's from Hatay. And she's a senior student in our department. She's interested in creative writing and philosophy, and especially themes concerning humanity, such as consciousness, spirituality, and ethics in science fiction works, they pique her interests. And now we're going to listen to Balthus. Yes, Balthus, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you for your uh, introduction. And let me share my screen. Yes, can you see my screen? Yes, it's coming, I think. Okay. We can make it full screen. Okay. Yes. Um, sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I will be discussing artificial ego versus human ego, the failed trial of roboethics in the 2014 film Ex Machina. Encyclopedia Britannica defines ethics as a discipline concerned with what is morally good and bad and morally right and wrong. It has also been defined by Richard William Paul and Linda Elder as a set of concepts and principles that guide us in determining, determining what behavior helps or harms sentient creatures. Despite the varying definitions made within the scope of centuries, when looked at from a broader perspective, ethics deals with moral with human morals of decision-making. Paul and Elder's definition stresses a clarification, behavior that helps or harms sentient creatures. Naturally, moral questions have been asked about human actions concerning their effects on other human beings, and within more recent discussions, other living beings. Since a sentient being could feel pain and suffer emotionally, mentally, and physically, Decisions when dealing with them could reveal a great deal about an individual's moral compass. But a similar judgment could not be made through the analysis of a person's usage of an inanimate object. The concept of an artificial intelligence, which has attained an understanding of itself, allows to create an area where a new approach to ethics could be examined. The existence of sentience in an inanimate being is a foreign concept for humanity. What artificial intelligence does, however, is bring a non-living being to a closer level of humanity. A study conducted by Meng Jun Li and Aeng So observed that greater anthropomorphism in AI-enabled technology leads to greater deal, greater degree of trust, likability, perceived warmth, and pleasure. Human psychology seems to tie consciousness with humanity and humanity to anthropomorphic characteristics, such as human speech or human-like facial features. This is one of the main factors which leads to the 
failure of human characters in the face of a presumably self-conscious AI in the film Ex Machina. Two of the four active characters in the movie, Caleb and Nathan, represent varying levels of human egotism. Nathan Bateman is a CEO of Blue Book, a search engine company. He is highly successful, ridiculously rich, a genius, and lives in isolation. His narcissism is almost immediately obvious to both Caleb and the audience. He also represents a toxic form of masculinity when um, contrasted with Caleb. Caleb's more tender approach to female representing AI, Ava and Kirko. Nathan is consumed with a universal humane experience, God complex. Despite his crude comments and views, Nathan does not aim just to create human-like sex dolls. He wishes for his creation to achieve an understanding of itself, to become, in his words, a conscious machine. When first introduced to Nathan's plan to put him through a Turing test with the AI he created, Caleb comments, if you've created a conscious machine, it's not the history of man, that's the history of gods. Nathan brings this comment up again and again, losing himself in the delusion of this exaggerated remark. While Nathan drowns in his hubris, Caleb also fails, but in a more seemingly benign manner. Manipulated by his boss, Ava, the newest and most advanced AI Nathan has created, is presented to him as a test subject, which he will determine if she is successful in mimicking a conv convincing human-level connection. Nathan puts Caleb into this test without concealing Ava's artificiality. This is the point where Caleb's self-appointed moral obligation and his intrinsic human response drives him to ruin. Whether Ava is truly conscious or, or capable of human emotion is up to debate. Consciousness is a difficult and abstract concept to explain. To this day, spiritual beliefs have provided convincing explanations to, her, to some, claiming that consciousness is an attribute unique to human beings. The ghost in the machine, soul, consciousness, the bridge between our physical flesh and the mind which conducts it is still a mystery and could only be the topic of a debate with no concrete scientific conclusion. Ex Machina demonstrates the human error of expecting humanity from beings which feign human-like behavior. Michael Graziano, an American scientist, professor of psychology and neuroscience, um, elaborates a elaborates on this phenomenon in his TED talk, which he based his book on Rethinking Consciousness, a Scientific Theory of Subjective Experience. He says, people are social animals. We attribute consciousness to each other. Whenever two people meet, four people are present. Me, you, the version of you I project onto you, and the version of me you project onto me. You project onto me. We do the same thing to more than just people. We attribute awareness. Um, we attribute awareness to our pet cats and dogs. That's reasonable. So I'm not talking about intellectually figuring out whether something has a mind. Instead, I'm talking about that automatic gut intuition, which is often wrong, but persuasively potent of awareness emanating from something. We attribute awareness to puppets and people and ourselves with the same machinery. The brain constructs simple social models of minds and uses them to understand itself and its world. Even as a smart programmer who is already aware of Ava's artificiality, Caleb is still compelled by her manipulations. He is informed about her true nature by scientific knowledge and, by, and also by her appearance. Unlike Kyoko, the other active AI, Ava's mechanical body is left barren. Her torso is transparent, displaying her intricate, obviously man-made mechanical systems. Her only humane feature is her face, which is later revealed to have been designed in accordance with Caleb's taste in woman. At some point, he asks Nathan why he gave Ava sexuality, that she could have simply been a gray box. Nathan disagrees, claiming without sexuality, beings would have no motive to interact with each other therefore with no interaction there would be no in, there would be no consciousness nathan says what imperative does a gray box have to interact with another gray box and this is kyoko the other ai in the film um, ava cunningly uses her boundless knowledge to manipulate caleb to her liking she appears to indulge in a date idea she presents to caleb with a faint childlike innocence 
and a romantic outlook on humanity. She asks if Caleb is attracted to her, if he thinks of her, flirts with him, claiming that he demonstrates physical signs of attraction, confusing him further. It could be said that if Ava was formless, just as Caleb had suggested, or if she possessed a form which did not appeal to Caleb, he might not have taken the drastic measures he did, which led to his eluded death. He is unable to realize that Ava's possible consciousness does not signify that she is human. It is quite easy to label Nathan as the villain of the story. If his treatment of Ava, Kyoko, or the other AI he has created in the past is the source of this labeling, it is important to ask whether his actions could be explained from a moral perspective. The true inner worlds of his AI are a mystery. It is unknown whether they feel physical pain or emotional anguish in a human way. In his work, The Ego Tunnel, Thomas Metzinger claims that if a system can insert an image of itself to its constantly updated understanding of the presence of a world, it becomes an ego. To Metzinger, this might make the artificial ego an object of moral concern. He stresses, though, the importance of an understanding of an independent self. Without this comprehension, the machine could not become an artificial ego and therefore assessed from a moral standpoint. He says in his work, a system that does not appear to itself cannot suffer because it has no sense of ownership. A system in which the lights are on but nobody is home would not be an object of ethical considerations. If it has a minimally conscious world model but no self model, then we can pull the plug at any time. But an ego machine, sorry, but an ego machine can suffer because it integrates pain signals, states of emotional distress or negative thoughts into its transparent self model, and they thus appear as someone's pain or negative feelings. When evaluated with this criteria, Ava might be considered an ego machine, as she desires to pursue her life independent from her creator. However, there could be no clear conclusion to reach on this matter, as her inner world is a mystery. Only through the glimpses of Ava's private moments, where she observes herself in the mirror as she wears artificial skin, could we deduce that she could be interpreting herself as an entity separate from the rest of the world. Considering Ava's unpredictable actions, uh, such as attacking Nathan and many others, we could say that he was not wrong to keep Ava captive. Him toying with Caleb's emotions and treating him just as a means to reach an impressive conclusion concerning Ava and creating human-like female representing sex dolls, which he could abuse and be cruel to with no consequences, however, could be utilized to demonstrate his moral misconducts. Him belittling Caleb and believing that the outcomes of his experiment will be so predictable also leads him to his death. All things considered, Ex Machina follows an interesting take on artificial intelligence and its moral implication about human ethics. Unlike more humanitarian interpretations of consciousness with an AI, such as you know, in Blade Runner or Detroit Become Human, Ex Machina deals with a more confusing but also realistic approach. An artificial ego machine is less likely to practice empathy or to feel the moral obligations we intrinsically do. Whatever an individual's values are learned or if they exist innately, humanity is almost always bound and limited morally. Despite each person's varying natures, they are still bound to self-appointed principles which they believe to be true. Because Caleb felt morally obligated to save Ava from imprisonment due to a subconscious drive, whether it is his attraction to her or his desire to become a helpless woman's hero, he was deserted to die. Ava, on the other hand, is free of any moral concerns. She does not feel remorse for causing Nathan's death or for abandoning Caleb who saved her. She does not even grieve for Kyoko or try to mend her, who is technically her kin, Ava's kin. She does not feel obligated to save either of them because it is not a required step to help her reach her ultimate goal to be free. She is just a machine with no dos, God, or anything that limits her, hence the title, Ex Machina, those removed. It is ironic as both men, Nathan, who glamorized her rational intellect, and Caleb, who humanized her, fall, fail, highlighting how consciousness, consciousness, which is already puzzling within humans, is bound to be unpredictable in the possession of artificial ego machines, which renders all speculations about self-consciousness a in AI useless as they will never approach the currently unspecified truth.
Thank you for listening. This is the end of my presentation. Marcus, thank you very much for this very interesting and philosophical discussion of what the AI and cyborgs uh, will present in front of us. They will just obviously present, they are presenting already very moral uh, questions. Whether, and I think this is one common point that I observe in other presentations as well. So we all pick very philosophical concepts. And I think uh, today we conclude our uh, panel with our final speaker. Uh, another very philosophical and sociological concept, uh, Ahmed Turu Chungur will present his paper entitled Ways of Being Them, Group Minds and Their Types. Okay, and unfortunately, Turu, I miss your biography, but I think everybody knows you. <laughs> it's all right. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Hello, everyone. Today I will talk about group minds, try to define them and how they appeared in our minds and try to categorize them in the end. Since the start of humanity's history, humans have tended to live in groups to survive. However, we created and wanted to protect a thing we called individuality. Even though we moved as groups to survive in the wilderness, each human believed he or she had a specific place in the group and separated her or himself from the others with several attributes. Thus, tension emerged between the individual and the group fundamentally. We think and change the boundary between these two sides and group minds are a result of such questioning. They are collective consciousness in which individuality lots its meaning in many cases. According to Merriam-Webster online dictionary, a group might is a hypothetical psychic unity or a collective consciousness of a group of individuals. This notion is studied not only in social sciences such as psychology, sociology and politics, but also in other areas like marketing and biology. Being more than an academic field of study, Group minds are a crucial part of literature, especially science fiction genre. Science fiction can create concrete examples for notions like group minds. These examples are experiments on the limitations of our individuality. After lots of experiments, group minds are separated into sub sub genres and names that can be used interchangeably, like gestalts and high minds in the science fiction corpus. Lots of different examples appeared in the works, such as them, more than humans, psychopaths, and starship troopers, and many more. Classifying all these other beings shows our fears and dreams. There are two approaches to classify them. The first approach focuses on the power structures. In other words, how collective consciousness works and applies its discourses. The second approach, on the other hand, looks at their cycle existence. Thanks to this approach, our ideas about bodies and selves can be studied around the group minds. In terms of governance or power structures, there are three kinds of group minds in science fiction, according to Joel Magus. The first and the most well-known one is hive minds. Hive minds are structures that have motto of all is one and one is all. In this kind of group minds concept, the members are not are aware of the thoughts of the other members of the community. Yet they see their ideas as their ideas. The thing from the same name movie series is a good example for hive minds. This thing can create exact imitation of any organism with just one cell. And every cell can move as a one single organism, which shows another ability of them. The members of a hive mind can make complete complex operations at the same time thanks to their ability to one as a whole commune. So as a hive mind structure, they have no burden of bureaucracy or central mind. Another near example is the unity from Rick and Morty series. Second type of group mind is over minds. Their motto is one mind to rule them all. 
they are just like gigantic ant and bee colonies. In this type, there is a central mind, which can be a single member or a small group of members. This central mind has the ability to overreach every member of the group and control them. In terms of sufficiency of complex operations, these central minds can be the best choice for single purpose operations, like building a nest for the whole community. However, unlike hive minds, they cannot do diff different complex operations at the same time. Moreover, because there is a member and members governed by it, these members can be tricked more easily than hive minds because they are generally in a state of zombie-like might and unable to act individually. After all, members share the consciousness and aim of the central mind, but still they have no access to whole group. The ants from them is a good example to such kind of group minds. Another example is Bugs from the Starship Trooper series. Here you can see Alien Queen as a central mind. The third one is called Egalimind. In the Egalimind groups, everyone has the same influence on the decisions and the concept of identity can be seen much more easily than the other groups. The members of these groups can share information and thoughts with each other. Thanks to this, multi-comparison is possible in this group. However, because individuality is a part of it, decision-making is problematic in this sense. Hegali minds are also considered the most democratic type of tree. Civil system from psychopath series is an example of this type. Lastly, science fiction not only creates a novum, but is a new and presented, but also experiments on it. In some works, a group minds we classify as one can be tested and tried to change into a different kind of blended experience. More than human by Theodore Sturgeon, Sturgeon is a good example for this kind of change. In the novel, the members of Homo Gestalt, which is an egali mind, is turned into an over mind by some leaders. The second method of classifying group mind is their physical existence. The key term for the first group is evolution. They can be called biominds and they share the same consciousness thanks to their evolutionary gain psychic powers. This group mostly appears in the form of insectoids and colonies like them or Tink. And also other examples from Starship Troopers and Tink. Apart from insectoids, some other examples of gaining psychonetic powers narratives have such kind of group minds. More than human and sensei can be given examples of such kind of biological group minds. The second type of group mind does not have a physical existence. All their operations and are in cyberspace. Agent Smith in the Matrix and Winternut from the Neuromancer by William Gibson are some cyber mind examples. This type of group mind is generally a product created by humans to control society or the inferior others. Lastly, cyborg minds are a blend of the former two types of group minds. Civil system is again another example to cyborg minds. This kind of categorization focuses on the concept of em embodiment. That is according to their relationship with reference to human body. In other words, these types not only reflect the tension between the group and the individual, but also lead us to question our bodily existence and experience. For instance, the biomance reflects our closeness with the flesh, aspect our bodies as we cannot get rid of our meat. The second group, on the other hand, demonstrates the opposite approach. In this perception, the flesh is absolute and totally abandoned in the complex and highly developed structures of cyber minds. In this category, the boundary between the biological human body and the technological cybernetic body is completely eliminated. In terms of cyborg minds, these are structures where body cannot be escaped from inevitable progress of technology whereas it's the still need of the body to life. In conclusion, science fiction as question of body 
in most of the works. Thus, each of these groups have we talk about as a version of these questions. These questions can be listed as what if there's a group that can act as one organism, which is hive mind? What if there's a group that can be controlled by its central mind, that is over mind? What if there's a group that can be shared thoughts and ideas with shared consciousness, which is egally mind? After these questions, the approach to physiology can be questioned. What if there's a mind have biological cyber or cyborg body? Answering to the, these questions help us to understand our existing group relationship. For example, with the speed of digital communication, today's parliament can share information as if they're an egal mind. And science fiction extrapolates this and shows how such structures can fail. Another example is how totalitarian regime, which work like an overmind, took our human sense and turns them into little single purpose machines. After all, as, as Rousseau Le Guin said, science fiction is not a prescriptive, it's a descriptive genre. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting terminology. Now uh, I have better understanding of how people act if a leader tells them, do this, do that. So I know a better terminology to deal with this phenomenon, not only in books, but also in real life. Uh, thank you very much for all. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, and very uh, fruitful uh, panel. But uh, and as I said, uh, from the very beginning, I can say that, and as my colleagues uh, concurred during the break, that this is virtually indistinguishable from any uh, you know, graduate level panel or maybe more academic panel. Uh, uh, so the, all the presentations were of high quality. So as I, I just congratulate you, but now there is another side to being an academic, the inquisition. So they, they uh, we all have to go through also serious questioning and then we all also have to answer questions and, and be as clear as possible about our arguments. Okay, now the floor is open for questions. Uh, so if, uh, if anybody would ask a question to any of the panel presenters, Oh, we already have Ozan Bulut, uh, and now I'm opening. To, okay, Ozan Bulut, you can uh, you can join us, Ozan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll have two questions, and due to the fact that I have a class in short notice, I wish to ask them uh, consecutively. Is that okay? Okay. Well, who are, who are you asking them to? Uh, first question is for Meltem Demiraran, and the second is for Eja Atlahan. Okay, shoot. Um, uh, Meltem, you explain us how you trace Kevin Barrett's notion of agential realism in the trilogy of Van der Meer. But how do you think uh, this notion of agen uh, agential realism works in our own lives? Um, and the second one is, as you mentioned earlier, scientific elements are used to solve human problems. What problems do they solve in Erevan? Can you give a specific example? Thank you. Okay, I think they, you just noted down the question, and I think we'll first listen to Meltem. Meltem, are you there? Yes, yeah, so I'm here. Um, okay, this is a long subject, but uh, I, will, I will try to explain it as brief as um, I can. Um, first of all, um, when we think about science, we tend to, I mean, societies um, tend to explain things in, in this human-centric way, like science is something like we create things and we we do stuff and we rule the earth this is the human centric view <clears throat> that hum humanism created and and uh, modernism uh, mostly created but <clears throat> actually science what science do is what science does is to discover things and, and in the last years there are like many researches that shows that we are not alone uh I mean, creating tools, creating communication, or communicating with other species. Uh, there's this biologist called Merlin Sheldrake. Uh, he does research in the Amazon about the um, fungus, and he says that they actually have uh, they actually have they have this network called the hyphea, uh, which is underground, and they connect with each other. Uh, the the fungi uh, connect with each other. And also, they help 
uh, the trees to connect with each other. They share like car uh, carbons and other stuff, and they also communicate. Even the invasive kind of trees and ad other kind of trees, they do that too with the help of the fungi, uh, uh, thanks to those hypia. And also uh, about this matter and uh, about about this objective. <clears throat> about the objects which uh, entangle to our uh, journeys in life. Uh, Bharat gives this uh, example. Um, she uh, gives this uh, experiment as an example. Uh, the experiment is called Cern and Gerlach experiment. Uh, there's this uh, uh, biologist again, uh, uh, which is uh, who, who is called Otto Stern. And they make an experiment about um, uh, the phenomena of space quantization and they try so many things but they cannot get to the point uh, where they want it and then one day they realize that the smoke affects it and they they could see the, that beam uh, in the in in the palace and uh the reason uh this all happened but i says that first of all otto stern is a jew who migrated from germany to america which you can guess why and um also uh the cigarette otto stern uh, smoked uh, was a cheap one uh, since he could afford only the cheap cigarette because um, that he was a Jew and he's from a low um, class in the society. The, the cigarette contained sulfur and it was what uh, actually activated the uh, what what caused uh, that be to be seen. So uh, everything is again entangled. I mean if if it was today, I mean, uh, we cannot smoke in the lab. So if it was today, Otto Stern couldn't smoke in the lab and this was not to happen. If he, he was not a Jew, he was not gonna smoke that cigarette. So everything is kind of entangled. I hope this all answers your question. Okay, and the next one was... Yes, and the other question was two, what, Ajay? Yes, the other one for Asia. Um, Asia, are you there? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, Osan, could you please repeat the question? Osan, we cannot hear you, maybe, have To no. repeat the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, scientists are used to. Oh. As you mentioned earlier, what? What is? Okay, uh, Edge, could you hear it? Or because was on you disappeared? Sort of, but I think I understand what he means. Okay. Um, so basically, all the concepts that I've been discussing, um, they are either exaggerated or used as a mockery material, let's say. Uh, so they're not the focus of the novel. But uh, if you were to think of for example, the distrust of machines, let's say, uh, because of this distrust, the uh, unnamed narrator uh, decides to go away with his lover uh, upon learning the Erevonian stance, uh, and they flee the country and live in a different place. So maybe we can say that the scientific element in this novel uh, provides the necessity for uh, going away and starting a new life with a loved one. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, Maria Doan is next to ask the question. Thank you. Um, I have a question to Kadir, to the presentation about the stalker. Um, so my okay, um, my question is um, uh, as follows: As I understand, the main theme that unites the film and the game—I'm not very familiar with the with the game—is human intrusion into the this uh, hostile territory, uh, into well the, the zone. Uh, in the film, there is one more creature, uh, except for the um, main characters that have that has um, the free entrance to the zone, and that is the black dog uh, that follows them along the way. Uh, is there something similar in the game? Yeah, well, actually, I have much watched this that film uh, many times, but 
trying to interpret that scene is really hard because uh, there is really uh, no clue about that black dog, but but uh, I don't know. If, uh, uh, as I remember that scene, uh, the stalker, the main character, uh, was remembering it. So it was a past moment. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I can't really relate it to the game because uh, I can't interpret that scene. All right. No, there there are a lot of interpretations. I, I was thinking that in the games, there are usually a, a dog that follows the main um, player uh, and helps the player. Uh, so that that was uh, what I was thinking about. Well, uh, in the game, no, there isn't something like that. Uh, there are uh, mutants, uh, both mutant animals from the uh, disaster, nuclear disaster and uh, there are also the uh, man-made ones uh, to keep stalkers away from the center of the zone so that uh, their secret wouldn't be discovered. Um, I guess that's the uh, closest relation I can make to that uh, scene in the movie. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't really uh, give a clear answer. Thank you. Thank you. But we got that there is, there is no dog in the game. Okay. There's no uh, some special look, but there are dogs in the game. Okay. <laughs> Complicated. We're going to play the game and see. Uh, Fukuo John, please. Um, some of our speakers they explored humanoid robots today. Um, when I first watched the film Ex Machina, uh, it scared me to death. Eva's cunningness, her, her tricks really frightened me. Um, so what are your projections for the future of humanoid robots with artificial intelligence? I'm asking this question to uh, Balkis or Kenan or any one of our speakers today. What do you think? Maybe Balkis can just start first. Um, I would like to thank for the question. And just as I had mentioned, consciousness is a very difficult term to understand within humans. Uh, there was a scene in the movie that I did not elaborate on to cu cut it short, but uh, after Caleb, the uh, the innocent man, after he witnesses how human um, Ava is becoming, he goes to the bathroom and there's a very graphic scene where he cuts himself open and he he looks at himself and he tries to make sure that he's human. I mean, he was born human. There is no reason for him to doubt this. But consciousness is a very abstract term. And when you start thinking about this, it's like trying to think about walking. Uh, it confuses you. So the future of AI is very bleak. And it's not easy to say that, oh, they will destroy us or oh they will just be humans like Detroit become human says or terminator terminator says um it's difficult because uh it's unpredictable we've only seen consciousness within ourselves we haven't seen consciousness uh within another being yet although we explore it in science fiction works uh so for the future of the future of ai and what it says about humanity is very um it's terrifying it is, uh, you know, it's like the fear of the unknown. And what we can do is just be aware because they are highly unpredictable, in my opinion. Yes. Mr. Kenan, do you have anything to add? Uh, in addition to what Belka said, as Detroit Become Human argues that in the, uh, robots or androids should be just one of us instead of rulers or dominators on humanity. I think I'm on the same page with the game's idea. 
I think in the future, if it's possible for them to develop conscience, uh, we should regard them as one of us and do, do not put them into superior or inferior place. And the future of artificial intelligence is, I think it will be more and more included in our daily lives. And uh, humanoid robots will be part of the society in the future. Even if they take our jobs or girlfriends? Uh, I, I mean, uh, we have the same problem with minorities uh in the history <laughs> they they said the same thing oh. okay that's an interesting connection thank you yes. thank you uh erdem maybe you can continue erdem, yes. i have a small question to kenan does the game mention asimov laws in the game uh the game itself does not uh, mention the Asimov's laws, but the main theme and moral message of the video game as shows androids have rights too, as I mentioned just before. Uh, they are individuals, and to count them as individuals, we should oversee the Asimov's laws, which puts them in inferior position. Okay, maybe next question uh, from Eileen Pekanik. Uh, hello, thank you so much for all of your wonderful talks. Uh, everything I heard today was of great interest to me, but I don't want to take up your time. So I'm going to ask only one question to uh, Bacchus Yelus. Uh, so Ex Machina is a movie that I really love, and I did readings of it uh, in the past. I wanted to ask you about it in terms of ethics and morals. Um, when we interact with any kind of artificial being, we uh, judge their morals with our human morals, uh, of course, uh, how they uh, treat us, how they treat others around us. Uh, but when you look at the movie, uh, Ava is uh, put through horrifying uh, circumstances where a human woman might also react in a very aggressive way. Uh, actually, uh, Ethan actually talks about this. He, I don't remember the exact quote, but he says, I put Ava in this horrible situation and I gave her a lifeline in the form of Caleb, uh, but she had to manipulate, she had to be socially and emotionally intelligent to get out. And at the end, she leaves everyone behind. Uh, but uh, Ethan, of course, is a more overtly evil uh, character, but I do think that Caleb, Caleb also doesn't have the best of intentions in mind uh, in terms of uh, objectifying Ava. So uh, when you think of uh, human morals, we also have self-preservation instinct, we have a uh, desire for autonomy, personhood, uh, and dignity. So a human woman placed in that situation might also just leave all of the men behind, uh, leave them to die and get out of there. Uh, I might actually do that if I was put in that horrifying situation. So it's very interesting in that, uh, what is what are our morals? Is it just black and white, don't kill someone or kill someone? Or if you are put in a situation where you are dehumanized and, and your dignity is taken away from you, you might also react in that sense. So that's that's what I wanted to ask, I guess, uh, when we look at artificial beings, when they act aggressive, uh, when they want to try to uh, form their personhood and we are trying to get in the way of that and they react in that sense, isn't that also acting in a very humane way? That's what I want to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. That is very like important for the movie's message. And you are correct. If a like it could be said that Ava's reaction was human, because if a woman was put in that situation, she has, in my opinion, too, every right to murder the men and escape. But uh, what I like, what gave me the impression that Ava was not entirely human was her treatment of Kyoko. Kyoko was also innocent and a victim in the situation. And like I said, we could consider her kin, her sister. They were created by the same man and Kyoko was abused more. She was not given the same uh, value Ava was given. Ava was an important project. She was kept in, kept in uh, closure. But Kyoko was just used as a sex doll. And she, we don't know what she says to her. Maybe she didn't say anything. Maybe they planned. Maybe she convinced her to sacrifice herself. Or maybe 
we don't know it's a mystery and that is left to our, to our interpretation uh, but she leaves Kyoko there Kyoko is not dead Kyoko could be fixed and she could have taken Kyoko with her I believe she had all the information in the world to fix Kyoko she could have taken Kyoko with her and they could have escaped together but she didn't and not because she's evil. I know my presentation might have come off that way that Ava is like this, uh, Ava is dangerous. But Ava is not good or bad. We don't know what she is exactly. Yes, her reactions are human when you look at it that way. But I think the movie focuses more on how we could not know. It's very ambiguous in that matter. Uh, but yes, it could. It's a very interesting point. It could also be uh, examined that way because uh, she was abused, and it does not. The fact that she is not human does not just justify Nathan's um, reactions because it says a lot about him. She is very human, and although if she is not, we are bound to perceive her that way. Him treating her like this with no remorse means that he could easily treat a real woman in this way. Uh, which is also, you know, it shows how uh, immoral he is. Yeah, that's all I have to say. I hope I was clear. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. I, I do agree in terms of, uh, in addition to gender, the movie also has uh, some racial dynamics that could have been more explored totally. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Aylin. And Dijle, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to comment on Foucault's question, actually. Uh, you, you were asking if uh, I think about the future of the of AI. I've been uh, you know researching about this for some time, and uh, what we were talking here about uh, you know about Eva and uh, how her motives uh, are morally good or ethically good, or we are um, taking this as uh, in human terms but uh, according to you all know harari he made a speech uh, lately he's made a speech and he said that uh, we gave AI the power of language uh, through chat gpt4 and as humans we created like almost all our power uh, motivations on language, like we created money with language, we created laws with language, we created religion with language. And now we have given the language to the AI. And now we're expecting AI to act morally good or humanely, you know, good or ethical. But uh, I think what we're, humans are making a mistake when they think that AI, um, should AI be considered uh, conscious? I, I, he says, uh, Harari says, it doesn't matter if it's conscious or not, because it has the power of manipulation. And even if it's not conscious, it can manipulate us. It, uh, it has the power of manipulation of people. So that's how I see the future of the AI. I think even if it's not conscious, it doesn't need to be conscious to manipulate us. And if you give the AI the question of fixing climate change, let's say, it will probably find psychological ways of manipulating humans into the right decision that it makes, which we might not approve. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Dijle, for your contribution. Thank you, Dijle, for your contribution. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Shabwal Tufan. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for these presentations. I really enjoyed listening. And uh, I have a question for Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed, I don't know if you played Cyberpunk, uh, but the high mind concept uh, reminded me of the network agents uh, that are responsible for um, monitoring the flow of information, and they seem to have a shared consciousness, and they uh, somehow work together as a group to protect the uh, integrity of the net. Uh, they work together to uh, monitor data flows and cyber attacks and stuff. Uh, we also, in the game, we also have the Voodoo Boys as a gang and cyber psychosis as separate entities. 
as uh, somehow collective beings. I want to ask you that, uh, can we relate this concept of uh, high minds to this game uh, in terms of these groups being a cohesive whole and uh, they are being interconnected or any other concept that you have mentioned? Uh, thank you for your questions. Actually, when we talk about cyborgs and uh, adding to cyborgs a cloud environment, we gen we directly reach the point of a cyborg mind in terms of uh, defining them from physiology. And after defining them physiology, in the example we can say, uh, I don't play cyberpunk, but I know Netwatch a bit. In Netwatch, you can see separate cyborgs uh, being together in the same consciousness to protect something for the flow of internet in the in this game. But uh, can we say uh, every kind of cloud environmental experience is uh, a kind of group mind experiment? Actually, when we talk about cyborgs, yes, but be uh, categorizing them in terms of their power relations in the I because I didn't play the game I don't know if they are a uh, hive mind or over mind but as far as I uh, search on the internet they are look like hive minds what make them hive minds is there is no idea of I in these examples in hive minds all subjects uh, consider themselves as we there is no other in the group for uh, themselves. That's what can I say about uh, network. That's what, what can I say about Netwatch in the game. Thank you so much. OK. Any other questions? OK, also, we are near the end of our the, plan time so uh, thank you uh, i would like to thank you my students and uh, the dear panelists now for their very interesting presentations and we have already received very good feedback uh, and congratulations from other people uh, so repeating what i said at the beginning so i'd like to welcome you into the world of academia as new candidates and i hope this will be a very good start for your future studies so I wish you success, and I'm leaving the floor to Ufukoja for one last time to conclude uh, today uh, panel and just say goodbye to you. After which we'll just can go back to our miserable daily lives. <laughs> so congratulations, everybody! I thank Jem Buja a lot for uh, organizing this undergraduate panel at the end of the semester. And I'm really thinking that, uh, just like Jem, who just said, this is going to be a very good start for you all, future academics. And we're hoping to see you in our MA, PhD um, entrance examination very soon. Uh, we are going to hold it in, in July. So uh, congratulations once again, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. You can we can all leave. I think it's goodbye. Hope to see you again. <laughs>